Hello everybody, my name is Jonas Sjols and I work as a postdoctoral researcher at two affiliations. I do uh, optical spectroscopy work at the Lumilab group at Ghent University in Belgium and I perform ab initio multi-configurational calculations at the Autonomous University in Madrid. Today's talk is about some recent work of ours on broadband infrared um, charge transfer luminescence. And uh, there is some recent interest in broadband infrared phosphors um, as some companies launched a product uh, which is a broadband infrared LED. And this product, which you see here, is proposed to be uh, added in future smartphones or other smart devices and that would have the functionality of uh, infrared spectroscopy that could uh, help people to uh, scan uh, groceries, for instance, and detect allergens or uh, determine whether a piece of fruit is rotten or not, or, or any other uh, fancy applications. Um, so here you can see the, this, this recent product. It is based on a blue uh, LED. So there's a blue LED chip here. And then on top of that, there's a broadband infrared phosphor that converts the blue light. And in this commercial product, the phosphor has a green body color, and that's due to uh, the chromium um, dopant which is inside. So um, you probably know chromium better from uh, sharp R-line emission that is, for instance, used in ruby lasers. But if you put the chromium dopant in a low crystal field host, uh, you can have some broadband emission because uh, the quartet T level uh, shifts below the doublet E, uh, the doublet E which is typically responsible for the R-line emission, but here you can have a broadband emission from the quartet T level. Um, that's very nice. Um, and this idea is picked up by many researchers and there are many papers on this kind of materials. Uh, for instance, this one. And indeed, you can see in the spectrum that you can obtain a very broad emission spectrum in this way with excitation bands in the blue uh, and uh, importantly with high quantum efficiencies. Um, but unfortunately, there is some downside to these chromium doped materials uh, due to their parity uh, forbidden uh, 3D uh, transitions which have a rather low absorption strength for blue light. So uh, that's the only downsides uh, for these materials. To overcome this difficulty, people have proposed to use different dopants like uh, Europium 2 Plus, where you have uh, parity allowed transitions. Um, so you can have uh, higher absorption strength. And this is uh, shown here by this work of uh, Chia, uh, where you have a very nice deep red body color. Uh, indicating a higher absorption strength. Um, the downside of these European 2 plus based materials is that their um, full width health maximum is smaller than in case of the chromium based materials. So it would be very nice if we could uh, combine the broad bandwidth of the chromium based material with the high absorption strength of uh, European 2 plus. And that's why we propose here a third um, candidate technology, which is uh, charge transfer luminescence. So it's a particular kind of charge transfer luminescence um, based on two metals, so metal to metal charge transfer luminescence, um, which we know, for instance, from a sapphire, which has a blue body color. Uh, so sapphire is based on a corundum crystal, aluminum oxide. Um, which has no body color, which is transparent uh, if it is pure. Although um, the blue body color originates from uh, some iron and titanium impurities in this crystal, which can transfer an electron uh, upon photon absorption. And this gives rise to a very broad uh, band in the visible range, giving rise to the blue col uh, body color of sapphire. In the following, we will uh, discuss this kind of MMCT transitions in lanthanide-based phosphors. We were happy to get this work published in Nature Communications, so if you think this is interesting, uh, please have a look to our paper. 
The system that we consider are uh, rock salt type sulfide crystals, calcium sulfide and strontium sulfide. And these are very well known as a host crystal for uh, europium 2 plus luminescence, uh, which can be tuned from the orange in case of strontium sulfide to the red, uh, deep red uh, in case of calcium sulfide. More recently, um, these uh, phosphors have been codoled by trivalent lanthanide ions, uh, for instance here uh, by Capobianco's group, um, where dysprosium is used to induce some uh, persistent luminescence in this system. Here we will use terbium as a codopant, um, and we will show you some spectra here. So the spectrum, the emission spectrum that you see here is, uh, is, is from calcium sulfide doped with only europium and you can see the well-known uh, broadband uh, red emission peaking around 650 nanometers. If we dope calcium sulfide with terbium, you get the typical green uh, terbium spectrum which comes from the inter 4F8 transitions. Uh, but then something special happens when you combine europium and terbium in this host. So you can see the, the red europium 2 plus emission, but in addition to that you can see some uh, emission originating in the near infrared range. So here we have uh, two curves with only a small uh, percentage of uh, the second dopant, but if we increase the concentrations also this um, near infrared emission uh, it's getting higher and higher. So if we use uh, even higher concentrations, the near-infrared emission dominates the entire emission spectrum. Um, very interesting to note is that we do not find a similar uh, thing for the strontium sulfide. So if we code up strontium sulfide with europium and terbium, we only find, we only find the orange europium emission, but no red or near infrared emission in addition to that. We investigated this further in our scanning electron microscope where we can uh, compare local chemical compositions measured by EDX with uh, local luminescent spectra uh, captured by an optical fiber and analyzed by a monochromator and CCD camera. So this uh, gives us maps like the one you see here, where we selected some uh, inhomogeneous grains in our sample to uh, take advantage of, of the inhomogeneity to properly visualize the effect that we want to study. Um, so you can see two grains, the larger grain, um, in the larger grain, the europium and the terbium are better distributed, giving um, more yellow dots, which uh, tells that that's well, europium and terbium uh, exist at the same spot, while here the smaller grain uh, has only red and green dots, which uh, tells us that the dopants are not well uh, distributed and they, they do not come together. And this is reflected in the luminescence properties. So uh, the smaller grain where the dopants are separated uh, is dominated by the red europium 5D to 4F emission, whereas the larger grain where the europium and terbium are well mixed shows the infrared luminescence. And this is also uh, the same data is represented on this graph, where you can indeed see that the infrared intensity uh, increases uh, with the product of the europium and the terbium concentrations. So you can see at some uh, critical uh, or at some equilibrium concentration um, the, the intensities, the relative intensities do not change anymore and you have a maximal amount of infrared emission uh, but still you will also have some uh, remaining red emission. So this uh, result indicates that indeed this uh, infrared emission band um, must originate from some uh, collaborative effect between the europium and the terbium dopants. To get some better understanding about the origin of this broadband luminescence, we performed first principles calculations. So we opted for uh, embedded cluster calculations uh, to, to model uh, the lanthanides in their crystalline hosts. Um, and we used multi-configurational calculations um, that account both static and dynamic electron correlation at a high level 
um, also including relativistic effects, uh, also spin orbit coupling via the Douglas Kroll Hess Hamiltonian. So we performed calculations on uh, individual ions, so individual europium 2 plus in these two host crystals. So we did calculations for calcium sulfide, where we find this infrared emission, but also for strontium sulfide, where we do not find this infrared uh, emission. So these diagrams show um, the uh, ground state and excited states of europium 2 plus in these hosts. And you can see the singly degenerate uh, ground state, which is the F7 ground state. And then you see a very dense manifold of um, excited states uh, coming from the F6 uh, 5D1 configuration, um, split in two sets, let's say, two sub-manifolds by the crystal field, the lowest one being the D2G manifold. Um, and then every manifold is uh, split, let's say, by the uh, exchange uh, coupling between the uh, 5D electron and the uh, F6 uh, subshell. And then you get a high spin uh, submanifold and a low spin submanifold. So uh, the ground state is obviously also high spin. So you have uh, parity and spin allowed transitions to the green levels in this figure and uh, spin forbidden transitions uh, to the red parts of this uh, diagram. So the yellow color is uh, used to indicate uh, the loss, let's say, of the spin, spin as a good quantum number. So uh, from these uh, diagrams and the oscillator strengths, we can calculate spectra and compare them to literature. So you can see that we get a uh, very reasonable correspondence with the experiments. And we also explained the origin of this staircase structure, which has been debated in literature for a long time. Um, if you want to know more about this, you can read our uh, paper dedicated to the details of the europium 2 plus spectrum which appeared in inorganic chemistry frontiers for the charge transfer configuration uh, we also need the electronic structures of trivalent europium as this is uh, the oxidized form of europium 2 plus and um, you can uh, recognize the well-known uh, septet f uh, levels in the lower uh, energy range and then the quintet levels, uh, and most notably the quintet D0 to uh, quintet D3 levels um, that are responsible for the red europium 3 plus emission. Of course, we also need uh, the electronic structure of terbium 3 plus um, for the ground state, but also of terbium 2 plus for the charge transfer configuration, which you see here. So in case of terbium 3 plus, you get the uh, similar septet F um, multiplets uh, here. And then you have the quintet D4 level, which is the emitting level, giving rise to the uh, green terbium 3 plus luminescence. In case of terbium 2 plus, we find a 4F8, 5D1 uh, ground state configuration. And uh, about 10,000 wave numbers higher, we find the uh, F9 uh, configuration. In order to obtain an energy level scheme that also shows the charge transfer state, we have to combine um, the individual energy levels of uh, both dopants. And we do this diabetically. So this means that, for instance, uh, the ground state configuration, uh, europium 2 plus together with terbium 3 plus, we combine uh, the corresponding energy levels and then every level uh, of our resulting energy level scheme is labeled with two labels, one label pertaining to Europium 2 plus, for instance, uh, octet S7 house for the ground state and one label pertaining to Terbium 3 plus, for instance, septet F6 for the ground state. So you can see that you get uh, very dense uh, energy level schemes uh, as you can also add all the excited states, um, the combined excited states where, for instance, europium um, is uh, excited to the 5D level 
and then uh, the terbium is uh, excited to these uh, septet F levels that come here and so on, uh, resulting in a very dense energy level scheme. The same has to be done for the charge transfer combination uh, configuration. There you have europium 3 plus combined with terbium 2 plus. Um, and this also results in a very dense energy level scheme. Of course, there is an energy difference between these two configurations. And this energy uh, difference is uh, by very good approximation given by uh, the ionization potential of europium 2 plus minus the electron affinity of terbium 3 plus, which uh, based on our ab initio calculations turned out to be uh, close to uh, 19,000 wave numbers. So uh, in these uh, diagrams, we used horizontal lines uh, for our energies um, obtained at the equilibrium positions. So as we uh, consider two centra, the europium center and the terbium center, we have two breathing uh, modes. So we have two coordinates, the terbium sulfur distance of the terbium cluster and the europium sulfur distance of the europium cluster. So for instance, in the ground state, europium is in a divalent state and terbium in a trivalent state. And we find ourselves here. Whereas in the uh, charge transfer configuration, the europium is in a trivalent state, uh, corresponding to a decrease in europium sulfur uh, bond length. And the terbium is in a two in a divalent state, corresponding to an increase in the terbium uh, sulfur binding length. So you can see that we have these two points here for, um, let's say, the ground state of the, the system and the lowest charge transfer state of the system. Uh, but of course, we can uh, fill this entire configurational space, this entire two-dimensional space uh, for every energy level. And then for en every energy level, we get a two-dimensional surface in this space. And, and this looks like this. For instance, um, when we combine uh, the emitting level here, the Europium 5D level, with the lowest charge transfer level. These uh, surfaces, uh, of course, they intersect. And this intersection is given here by this red curve. And this intersection has a lowest point. So this is the lowest energy along this intersection which is the saddle point between these two local minima. Um, and as such, we can define an uh, electron transfer coordinate, which is a linear combination of uh, the two breathing modes that crosses um, the intersection in the saddle point and which connects the two local minima. So um, in the next step, we can uh, cut our two-dimensional surfaces along this line and then we obtain again configurational coordinate diagrams for all the pair states um, in this uh, along this straight line. So uh, if we do this for uh, the levels that were plot we get a figure like this but of course we can extend this to all uh, the pair states uh, europium 2 plus terbium 3 plus ground state configuration on the left side and the charge transfer configuration European 3 plus terbium 2 plus on the right hand side. And you can see indeed in this case our charge transfer state turns out to be metastable and um, some radiative uh, decay can be expected uh, in accordance with experiments. So we do a similar calculation for uh, the strontium sulfide host. And you can see that this uh, charge transfer configuration is at almost the same energy, uh, or around 20,000 wave numbers. But the, the offsets and the curvatures of the energy levels are different. And uh, in case of strontium sulfide, the minimum of the uh, charge transfer configuration is crossed very close uh, to the minimum by these branches and therefore we should not expect any radiative uh, decay, but uh, if we reach this excited state, it will very rapidly decay non-radiatively to the ground state. 
So uh, the electronic energies are almost identical in both cases. So um, then we have to ask ourselves the question, what is driving this uh, difference in functional behavior? And this turns out to be uh, what we call delta D uh, donor acceptor, which um, is nothing more than the difference in um, europium sulfur or terbium sulfur distance in ground and excited state. So here uh, it's plotted for both europium and terbium, uh, the equilibrium bond length in case of the trivalent ion, um, and also the equilibrium distance in case of the divalent ion. And you can see that this difference, which is the uh, relaxation, which corresponds to the nuclear relaxation during this uh, charge transfer is smaller in case of calcium sulfide than in case of strontium sulfide. And that is actually the important parameter that determines the difference in uh, functional behavior, as we can see here. So we start with a metastable charge transfer state, like in the calcium sulfide case. But then if we increase this parameter, which would give rise to uh, these two equilibrium uh, points that drift apart and if they drift apart at some point this crossing of the ground state level will go through the minimum of the charge transfer state giving rise to non-radiative relaxation as in case of the strontium sulfide. Another impor important parameter in this uh, model is the uh, vibrational frequency which gives uh, the uh, curvature of these uh, energy levels. Um, this can also play a role, but this uh, can be neglected uh, when we compare calcium sulfide to strontium sulfide as they have very comparable uh, phonon energies. And of course, another important parameter is um, the ionization potential of the donor and the electron affinity of the acceptor. Um, which, of course, dramatically uh, affects the energy of the uh, lowest MMCT state. Uh, but as we have seen um, for europium terbium and these sulfides, the, the electronic energies are at the same uh, energy position. And the uh, important parameter is the difference in uh, bond length between the divalent and the trivalent species. So now we were able to explain uh, the origin of this infrared emission. Um, we still need to assess its usability, as there is some uh, demand for infrared, broadband infrared phosphors, as explained in the beginning of my talk. So we prepared um, a phosphor converted LED. Here you can see our phosphor, which shows a very nice deep red body color, indicating indeed a high absorption strength for blue light. And here you can see, uh, well, some kind of infrared emission, which is captured by an infrared sensitive camera. And uh, the black square that you see here is a cutoff filter that blocks out all the blue pumping light that got, uh, was transmitted by the phosphor. And you can indeed see that we obtain a very nice broad uh, spectrum uh, starting in the red and ranging uh, into the infrared. So we need to compare this to uh, the established technology, let's say the chromium-based uh, phosphors and the other alternative, the uh, divalent europium-based phosphors. And we can see that we can have a comparable bandwidth or even a slightly larger bandwidth uh, than the chromium doped phosphors. Uh, we get a very good absorption strength uh, comparable to the europium 2 plus phosphors, which makes sense as also here, europium 2 plus is uh, the absorbing ion. Um, but uh, compared to chromium 3 plus, we also have rather low quantum efficiency, which is uh, also typical for these uh, europium 2 plus uh, based phosphors. So I think uh, we are not there yet. And um, yeah, for all these three uh, potential technologies, uh, some work has to be done. Finally, I come to my conclusions. Uh, so we investigated broadband infrared emission um, from um, metal to metal charge transfer between europium and terbium in a calcium sulfide host. So uh, 
We used uh, multi-configurational ab initio calculations to explain the luminescence mechanism. And this uh, work is uh, potentially useful for uh, future applications um, on uh, infrared spectroscopy, on uh, handheld electronics, for instance, where um, phosphor converted LED is used based on blue pumping LED and uh, broadband infrared phosphor on top of that. Finally, I would like to uh, thank my collaborators. As the sun already went down here, uh, I think it's a good moment uh, to stop. I thank you for your attention and uh, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to mail me 